Good afternoon. How are you today? Well, it's overcast. This is part of the Jefferson report. It's overcast. And uh, the temperature is like 56, which isn't bad. I have a slight chill from it. There's no wind, real wind. So it's not a bad day. Uh, apologies to those who have more severe weather wherever you are. But the good thing about weather is <laughs> it changes. It's not always for the worst. So what are we concerned about today? Well, there are two things. One is a regional disaster in which a ship literally ran into a bridge in Baltimore. And uh, I have to take Holly to uh, a procedure up there tomorrow, one of these, you know, procedures to keep track of how things are going, a bronchoscopy. And uh, because they put her under a little bit, I have to drive her, drive her back. But uh, aside from the news of the bridge, there are lots of things going on, but my focus is the Supreme Court because it's a continuation of Dobbs. And it may be a pivot to worse policies and more restraint on women and their right to be let alone and to do what they want with their own body, whether they choose to consult with physicians or family or friends or whatever. But by way of background, let's talk about uh, how this happens. For example, Holly and I didn't think <laughs> we were going to get pregnant uh, or she was going to get pregnant. But uh, she did, and she had an ectopic pregnancy. And uh, that is a very unsettling event. So why do I mention it? I mention it because it happens. It happens at different ages and so forth. And it's one of the possible scary outcomes of taking the abortion pill. But you have to put things in perspective. And that is... Uh, the side effects, we, we didn't, by the way, we didn't, uh, I don't even know if there was an abortion pill when we had the ectopic pregnancy. But anyhow, the, um, the danger of something like that happening, requiring an emergency room visit, uh, is about the same percentage for all pregnancies, less than 1%. So why does that matter? Because the argument before the Supreme Court was about the so-called abortion pill. And uh, it can be one of those factors for the emergency room. But since Dobbs, 63% of greater than 1 million abortions in 2023 involved the abortion pill. So it's become an answer a legitimate, safe, healthy answer to the question, can you get an abortion? And, uh, you know, there are timing and other requirements, and anybody who's thinking of doing it has to get on top of those things. But the pills have been mailed uh, so that the expanse of this is a remedy for a health condition, uh, which is whether or not to, to bring forth a child or have an abortion, the woman can make that decision and she doesn't even have to go to a doctor. And part of that is because of government regulation that permits it to happen. And it's been more liberal in recent years because the Medicine has appeared reliable and safe. Now, so what was the argument about? What the argument was about is the same one we have all the time with these freaks who want to control a woman. And the women are rightly pushing back and I celebrate that they have this alternative, which is the uh, birth control pill. 
uh, or abortion pill rather. And so there were last year, in part because of the pill and the Dobbs decision, 33,000 fewer brick and mortar abortions. So the effort by those who because of their Christian beliefs and not because of medical science who would lim limit a woman's right to be let alone and to take care of herself has been aided by the abortion pill. And so the argument before the Supreme Court was lopsided. It was to talk about those instances where there's a problem with the pill, as I said, less than 1%, and there are alternative reasons for that 1%. So I don't know what fraction of that 1% these could be. And so how did the argument go? The plaintiffs in the case are doctors who are <laughs> against abortions. And they say, oh my God, I wouldn't want to have to, in an emergency room, be involved in in an abortion. Now, at least one or maybe two of the doctors who are the moving force in this have actually been involved in or assisted in abortions. Now, here's the kicker. And I disagree with this, but this is the way it is. A doctor can, based on their conscience, say, I am not going to be involved in this abortion. Okay, now that bothers me for a lot of reasons, but it turns out that the Solicitor General says it is presently an exception, so no doctor has to uh, do this if, as a matter of conscience, they don't want to do it. Now, the argument by the anti-abortionists was, well, you know, it's an emergency room. There are difficulties that happen. And there was a question by the justice about whether or not any of these doctors had objected at the time that they were involved with any abortion and invoked the exception that applies to them. And as best I could tell, as I was writing, the answer was, no, they didn't object. So their elective not to be involved was not invoked by any of the doctors bringing this case. And the argument of it being an emergency uh, has been covered by other people. And finally, <laughs> they would have this rule apply to what? All people who, all women who might use the abortion pill because 1% or less of the use of that pill has side effects. Now, you may or may not have in your medicine chest things that you take uh, and, and, and the stuff is not regulated, but you may also have medicine that a doctor has prescribed for you. And every one of these medicines has side effects and risks, and they describe what they are. So it's kind of business as usual for how we take care of our health. So this is an adventure by the anti-abortionists to limit a woman's right to use a pill that may be safer than surgical procedures and is probably less expensive, though a procedure like this may be covered by insurance. And the anti-abortions want to cut off all paths to have, well, an abortion, or is it really a form of avoiding a possible birth? So what do you think we should do about this? Well, I think, I think they should deny the whole thing. Because once again, the plaintiffs are bullshitting us. They're not at risk to do something that they don't want to be involved in. And they 
are talking about a tiny percentage of all those uses they have. And they're setting up the Supreme Court as the arbiter of medical science when we've done all these tests and so forth in the government agencies that justify the use as they are now being used. So I celebrate capitalism, which is obviously one function of the use of the birth control pill that has been found medically sound. And I understand that one has to be careful about the source of the uh, abortion pill that one uses, but that's, you know, that's common sense. And what we have is innovation to cure an effort by the government, by the Supreme Court, by the cult of six, in an Alito decision to deny to women their right to be let alone. And so this innovation, which is in part a medical rebellion, fulfills a woman's right to be let alone. So I'm all for it. And if the Supreme Court didn't have so many jackasses on there, this wouldn't have even been heard. But, uh, and you know, it's come, things are coming up through the court system that send us back years and years. And uh, I can't help but believing that there are some women, perhaps young, perhaps poor, perhaps not aware of what they can do, that are having alleyway abortions with all the old ways that caused all the pain and suffering and injury and death to women who couldn't get an abortion, couldn't afford it, were told they couldn't have it. So the argument today, it's been suggested by the questions, will lead to a very narrow reading of the demands by the doctors. But here we have again hypothetical doctors who claim that, oh my God, I don't want to be involved in an abortion, and yet they have no evidence that they ever sought to invoke this permissive election until they filed this case. And then, oh my God. So what else is going on? Well, there are a couple of things that interest me, uh, and perhaps you. One is how we deal with Israel. Now, Netanyahu, he's a dinner guest you might not want to have. <laughs> Apologies to those who love him, but I, I can't see it. The, uh, so Netanyahu is upset that in the UN, America abstained. Now, they abstained from a ceasefire proposal that required there also being a handing up of the hostages. Now, the, there were 14 who were for this passage. Now, we could have vetoed it, and we, we did previously, but we did not. We abstained. And so, a fair argument is that all these nation states wanted this, and so it was plainly a majority choice. And we have been conflicted, but we were not ready to defy what the majority wanted. And so, as a result, the measure passed. Now, Netanyahu is furious with us, and there was a meeting scheduled this week in Washington between Israel and us, and Netanyahu has canceled it. Now, this is the mark of a small man, because what is the danger of having a sit-down and talking about it? So you cut off communications, <laughs> undermining our efforts to support Israel with funds, and Netanyahu presumably needs these funds 
and he acts this way. Now, you know, he has, despite some reports, he has trouble with his own government, trouble with the prosecution of himself. And some people have decided, like happens in any war zone, enough is enough is enough. So I don't think Biden has anything to apologize for. And I think that was a, a proper way to handle the situation. And, you know, I guess Net, maybe Netanyahu says, don't give us any money. <laughs> they already have our equipment and our money and ways to get more. So, uh, well, he's a problem. We have many on the world stage this day, these days. Um, I saw a picture in the paper of Trump when he was here to set the trial date, which he hoped he wouldn't set. And he's standing with his lawyer. And I had this impulse to say, I wouldn't want to stand next to that man under any occasion that would suggest that I was in allegiance to him. And you know what it's like probably to be his counsel. He figures he buys counsel and then they do what I say, I trump. And if they don't, he fires them or doesn't pay him. And uh, I once overheard a mob figure talking to his lawyer in a case, and he was not happy with what happened in the courtroom. And I was familiar with that because I was the prosecutor in the case. And he crooked his finger to have the lawyer come see him in the space between the courtrooms in the Southern District of New York. And he shouted at him as if he were <laughs> a button man. Uh, Button Man's a guy who shoots and kills people, uh, who gets promoted in the organization by doing this. Okay, now, that's not what happened, but, the, you know, the sense of the moment was intimidation by the thickness of my voice, you know, the power I'm exerting and so forth. And I thought, Trump, who emulates Roy Cohn and his mob associates, he probably thinks the same way. And these people do things that probably defies their experience in legitimate cases. And yes, I know it's not a legitimate, but there are some things these lawyers have done and they've answered for it in court or they're going to answer for it in court or have been charged with it. And so we know it's not a fiction. So standing next to him in a picture, <laughs> can't imagine it, but... We've seen a bunch of people do it. So let's hope the Supreme Court gets it right. We won't have a decision until June. And let us uh, continue to hope that the abortion pill is used to save the nightmares that life would be without it for many women. And let's uh, hope that somebody brings Israel by whomever to a table to discuss what is our exit strategy to killing and bloodthirsty behavior in the Middle East. So, uh, I say, <laughs> have a good evening. And uh, I don't know because I'm going to uh, Johns Hopkins tomorrow if we get back before it's dark. But if I do, we'll be here on the... Uh, we're the Cathedral of Trees and talking about whatever's going on. All the best. Bye-bye.